This is a new edition of Pathfinder and it is version 2.1 and I'm going to talk about how that is because they are publishing what they're calling a Pathfinder remaster. I'm going to be going over the things that they spoiled during their PaizoCon online convention event this past weekend and also through what they revealed on Reddit. I'll include a link to their stream in the video description. Also, I thank Ezekiru YT for compiling everything that the Paizo staff revealed on Reddit in a Google Doc. I will link this as well in the description. I put out a video saying that this is going to be version 2.1, and my gut instinct was confirmed by one of the leading staff of Paizo. I'm going to play the video. You know, we, we've said many times, like, this isn't a 2.5, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've seen the conversation. I think the one that I, I think uh, always kind of appeals to me the most is when people are like, it's more like a 2.1. And I'm like, yeah, if you if you think of, like, the core rulebook has had four errata waves uh, up to this point, about one a year, maybe not in exactly that smooth pacing, you know? Then maybe it was like 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.04. And this is the first two point one uh entry you know it's still very much the same game uh we we're not changing the math for example mm -hmm. right uh we're not changing uh any of the core structures of this this was a clip from michael sayer's interview with dave barnhart also known as how it's played who has an excellent youtube channel for learning the pathfinder rules but yeah, I'm calling this a new version of Pathfinder. There are significant changes, the biggest ones being that alignment is removed, and also spell schools for spells are also removed. And when I use the word addition, I'm just using the dictionary definition. It's just another version of the game. Now, on what number to call this new edition of Pathfinder? Let me preface this by saying that with regard to the new edition of D&D, I've been insisting on calling it 6th edition on principle because improving a game should not be stigmatized and D&D has been taking the opposite tact and not being honest that it's a new edition and that PR has also hampered the ability of the design team to improve the game at the moment. Now, whether this new Pathfinder edition should be called 2.1, or third edition, or 2.5, I'm not as at war with the Paizo team on messaging as I am with WotC. And truthfully, there is importance to what version number you assign something, because there is the convention in D&D and D&D-derived games that a new edition, whole number edition, involves rebuilding the game from the ground up. I think it's appropriate to call this version 2.1. They are not simply printing new books and separating from the OGL. They are opening up the patient, was the phrase used by Michael Sayer, to improve the game. And I would compare it to the edition change from 3.0 to 3.5 for that reason, in that they were opening up the patient, nothing was safe, in order to make their original vision work better. However, calling it a 0.5 edition kind of paints you in a corner, because what is the next edition called after that if you are not rebuilding the game from the ground up? And also, frankly, second edition Pathfinder is more stable and requires less fixing than 3.0 D&D did, which was revolutionary in its time. The extent of changes is less than what we saw between 3.0 and 3.5. As Michael Sayer said for Pathfinder 2e, the basic math is the same. Whereas for the change to 3.5, there was quite a number of changes that included folding several skills together, making changes to all the classes, and I'm going to put up on the screen advancement tables for the Monk and the Ranger to show how much changed between 3.0 and 3.5. The monsters were rebuilt to be built more like characters in their hit die and feet advancement, and there was a big change to damage reduction. Instead of being bypassed by plus one to plus three magical weapons, special materials, whether a weapon was good aligned, things like that bypassed damage reduction. And all of the stat blocks were redone. In the end, what I think matters most in an addition change is whether it addresses expressed and unexpressed needs that people want who are playing or running the game. 
Some people, sure, may not want to buy new books, maybe unhappy that the current books are out of date. On the other hand, the current books, because the basic math is unchanged, are still usable. You can still use the current versions of those classes and monsters. You still have the core mechanics and systems. You still have the smaller number of bonus types. You still have the basic proficiency system of adding your level plus two, four, six, or eight. And admittedly, yes, this is not an insignificant number of changes. They have said this is more like an errata plus. And I would say it's even more than an errata plus. This is, like they said, opening up the patient. And I think from what I've seen so far, when it actually comes out, the vast majority of the community will see this as a strict upgrade and will not want to use the older materials. Fortunately for all of us, all of the rules that come out with this new edition will be free online. Come on, Megan. Also, it just makes sense to have this new edition now because the OGL debacle by Wizards of the Coast makes it necessary for Paizo to future protect its publications so that they are not exposed to potential legal action since Wizards of the Coast has been a bit unscrupulous lately. It's also well-timed because of the OGL fiasco and a lot of people now looking for non-D&D role-playing game systems and the new D&D edition coming out next year, which is usually the occasion for people to join or leave a game system. At PaizoCon, they put out a lot of teasers and gave out tidbits of information that I'll go over now, and we're going to be seeing more previews between now and the release of the Player Core and GM Core books in November. Megan, just sit on my lap again. So I'm going to cover the things I'm most excited about and that I think most people will be excited about. First was the fact that they said that they're going to have new navigational elements in these books. And I'm that kind of excites me because there's a big difference in ease of learning the game between the current core rulebook and the beginner box. And I hope that this announcement that they're going to introduce navigational elements, I hope that means that they are revisiting making the game easier to learn from the book, which is a weakness of the current core rulebook. The next big change is that alignment is going to be gone. That also means that alignment damage is going to go as well. There are some effects, including the Divine Cantrip, Divine Lance, that did alignment damage, which many new players were disappointed by because it only did damage to creatures of the opposite alignment. Neutral creatures were immune. I am happy to see that mechanic go. I think it was just a feels bad for many players. What will move in its place is something called spirit damage. Characters like clerics will be able to sanctify themselves in order to make themselves holy or unholy, so that spirit damage, which targets only creatures with a soul, will do more damage to some creatures. So a holy cleric will do more damage against a devil for instance. They also said a reason for this was to give a unique thing to divine spellcasters and occult spellcasters, damage-wise, I think, that primal and arcane casters could not do. Another big change is that basically all ancestries will be potential versatile ancestries. For those who don't know, in Pathfinder, when you pick your race or ancestry, you can also have a sub-race or heritage in Pathfinder it's called, but that heritage was an opportunity to be a tiefling or beastkin in addition to being your core ancestry. Currently in Pathfinder, being a half-elf or half-orc was a heritage of the human ancestry, and these terms kind of implied that you were half-human. Now those terms don't have that assumption anymore. What will simply happen is that the elf entry will have rules for us to graft elf onto another ancestry. And also orc will be in the player core book with the same treatment. And being a half orc will not be limited to just a one page of feats, but will have a full suite of feats that come from the orc ancestry as it is currently published in other books right now. So the half orc will be fully supported in the book that it's presented in. They are also grouping tieflings and asimars, things that involve a union between humanoids and some other planar being, nephilim. You'll be able to mix and match more freely. Under the new rules, you can have angel and demon be in the same character. 
or be an angel that has animal or beast-like aspects. This makes me appreciate Pathfinder's customizability because in the D&D playtest, they presented a new playtest race called the Ardling that had your head be an animal and presented this as the player handbook celestial race. There was pushback against that. They went back to the drawing board. D&D's in the position of figuring out what is the most popular and what's less popular to figure out what to put on a platter for you. But Pathfinder gives us the tools to make those choices ourselves. Similarly, the Druid playtest for D&D was very wild shape focused, whereas I like how in Pathfinder you can choose to be wild shape focused with your Druid if you want to, and maybe you might not want to. Now we move on to the sex seat. We move on to the classes. So I'll go through them alphabetically. First of all, the Alchemist, Barbarian, and Champion are moving to Player Core 2. The Bard, what we heard is that they're going to get proficiency with all martial weapons. That's a new thing. And so the Warrior Muse will get something new that they only teased at. They did not say what that was. The Cleric got a big announcement. The Cleric currently has two doctrines. There is the War Priest Cleric, which is the classic D&D warrior priest, and the Cloistered Cleric, which is like the White Mage from Final Fantasy. They acknowledge the imbalance in the fact that the Cloistered Cleric could take the benefits of the War Priest by taking archetypes such as armor proficiency, or getting proficiency in martial weapons. While the War Priest could not get access to legendary proficiency in spellcasting. So they've boosted the War Priest a bit. And I'll say that a number of these things are agreeing with some of the criticisms out there that some options are less balanced than others in Pathfinder 2e. What they've done with the War Priest is they have made some feats that are War Priest exclusive, including getting heavy armor proficiency. You didn't have to go outside the cleric class anymore to get that. And letting your basic progression from your doctrine give you expert proficiency with all martial weapons at level 7. And your deity's weapon, you get master proficiency at level 19. That's later than martial characters, but it seems to coincide with the fact that the Cloistered Cleric gets legendary proficiency in spellcasting at that same level. There may be more feats for the War Priest to support them being in the front lines fighting in melee as well. Next is the Druid. The Druidic language will now be called Wild Song and have some flavorful text about how it sounds like animals or other sounds from nature. The metal anathema will be removed for druids, which I am happy with. I always thought it was weird that druids could not wear metal armor, but they could wield metal weapons. Also, metal is from the earth. I, I don't know. I'm happy to see that kind of arbitrary feeling distinction go. And they looked again at the orders and gave some more love to some underserved orders. They talked about the storm order druid being able to create a thunderclap or leaving snow on the ground. And for the Leaf Order Druid, for their familiar to be able to have something like Bark Skin to give them resistance to damage. For the Fighter, they said there wasn't going to be much that changed. We're going to say goodbye, however, to the Open trait, which was a trait on some fighter feats like Sudden Charge that said that you couldn't make an attack or do another open action before you did an open action. It was something people forgot about, they said. And I think it's not going to change the balance of the game too much. They said in the stream that things that were not pulling their weight, things that were just adding complexity with little benefit, they were just going to remove. So I think this is one example of that. The fighter would be indirectly affected by some changes that are systemic that will be affecting all martial characters. And they said that the Athletic skill will have more defined uses, including the reposition action, which sounds useful. It sounds like, I'm going to guess it's a way to move somebody within your reach that is not necessarily away from you, like shove. But I hope that while they're at it, they will give a buff to the disarm action. I will say it again. I said it in an earlier video, because right now the regular success almost never does anything to a creature. We see more improvements for the other martial classes, the Ranger and the Rogue, and I will say that this is Paizo acknowledging that maybe the fighter is a little stronger than other martial characters at many tables, and so they are kind of doing a stealth rebalancing in this regard. So for the Ranger, there were feats that were limited to your 
hunted prey, you had to use that action to focus on an individual creature and then use another action before you could do the same against another creature. They are going to be making those abilities more flexible. Warden spells from the Advanced Player's Guide are now going to be included with the Ranger in the, the core book that they are presented in. And the spell DC will be advancing at the same time as their class DC now. In the stream, this is also when they drop that there'll be some improvements, it sounds like, to make crossbows more appealing so that a crossbow ranger didn't feel like they were paying a feat tax in order to get the crossbow ace feat in order to make it viable. That feat will be helping you in another way. But yes, we're going to get an arbalest, a big massive crossbow that has reload one, but it sounds really interesting. And also Michael Sayer on Reddit said that Crossbows will now be their own weapon group, and it will have the critical specialization effect of giving bleed damage to a creature, and that's exciting to me. Next is the rogue, and the big change for the rogue is that they're going to be proficient with all martial weapons, which uh, kind of is was kind of true in early D&D history. They were proficient with swords, just like fighters in the earliest editions. And it sounded like they wanted rogues to have access to all the cool martial weapons that are in the treasure vault, apparently. They're going to be giving more distinction to the rackets by incentivizing certain weapon groups or types, apparently. And they also dropped that the scoundrel rogue will be able to step when they faint. Next, they are including the witch in Player Core 1. It looks like this will have the most changes and improvements to it compared to the other classes in this book. The first thing they said was they want to dial up the flavor for the, the witch. I also think it's a popular class concept. I've had three players now in my D&D YouTubers Learn Pathfinder series who have gravitated to the witch because it wasn't available in D&D. They want to make the witch's patron more distinctive, make your patron more present where your abilities invoke your patron to help you. It also sounds like your patron will give your familiar a unique ability such as the Winter Patron letting your familiar do a cold breath that whenever you cast a Hex spell. They also teased a couple of feats, it sounded like. There's Witch Armaments that gave you both hair and nails that you could attack with, and a feat that lets your patron use your body as a conduit to reach out and attack the soul of a creature. And apparently you can also turn a polearm weapon into a broom with another feat. I'm looking forward to a more flavorful witch myself. I think that the current one is a bit bland, at least compared to the first edition witch. The last class is the wizard, which is going to get proficiency with all simple weapons. And we also have our other big change. Spells will no longer belong to spell schools. It sounds to me like this is justified by the breaking from the OGL, but it also sounds like they thought it had limited use for the game. They now want wizards instead of uh, specializing in one of the eight schools, which you were limited to eight schools by the system, they can now have any number of schools that are actual schools that a wizard studied at. There'll be schools such as a school for battle magic that lets you have spells like fireball or spells that you would imagine a wizard accompanying an army would have, such as spells to put mist in the battlefield, bring down flying enemies, or to resist energy. It wasn't clear from the stream exactly how these new schools will operate. They said they will be not identical, but pretty similar. Currently, you get a bonus spell slot every spell level that must be it from your spell school. And they say that it's going to be a smaller number of spells. But fortunately, the wizard is not precluded from still adding spells from the entire arcane list to their spell book. So that doesn't seem like a big loss. And it also seems like it's an opportunity to give more focus and flavor to the school. So it seems like a positive change to me. As opposed to the Conjuration School, which they said had four different categories of magic within it, other schools that they're talking about having are Civic Wizardry, where you can build walls, summon constructs, do Wall of Stone, have creation spells, and do some Earth spells. Then the School of Protean Form about biological manipulation spells like Gouging Claw, Tangle Vine, Plant Spells, and the spell Spider Sting. And they're going to use the word curriculum to describe the spell lists that you're getting from the schools. So they get even more nerdy. Currently they have an arcane thesis, now they get a curriculum as well. 
the universalist school will be replaced by unified magical theory. They will not have a curriculum, but I assume will have other abilities to compensate for that. They then said that removing spell schools will mean that there'll need to be revisions to some older abilities like the spell weapon, which added a type of damage that depended on the school of the spell you just cast. I'm next going to be talking about changes to spells and changes to items. The biggest change to me is that the way you restore focus points is changing. You can now restore all your focus points with enough refocus activities. Currently, if you have a pool of three focus points and you spend all of them in a battle, when you refocus, you can never go back above one. Now they don't have that limitation anymore, and the feats that let you restore up to two or three focus points when you refocus, those are going to be to let you now get all three focus points back with one single 10 minute refocus activity. So this is a little buff to spellcasters. Hmm. I wonder if that's a design goal of theirs. They're going to do away with the system currently of having spell components, verbal, somatic, material, and focus, and just put the useful rules and I suppose flavor text in the spell itself so that you're not cross-referencing, which sounds like a good change. Some spells that are OGL dependent are going to be changing names or be replaced by something similar serving its use in the game. Force Barrage, which they described in the stream, is clearly not Magic Missile. They're also using this occasion to improve, make some spells sound more fun to me. Uh, Frostbite, I assume, is a replacement to Ray of Frost, which if the target critically fails its save, it will have weakness to bludgeoning damage. And that they planned that so that there could be more talk at the table. So that, for example, you can say, I'm going to do this ice spell so that our fighter with the maul can do more damage to the creature. That sounds like an improvement to me. And then they gave a few tidbits. Magic weapon will now be called runic weapon and also still be useful after the first few levels. So it will give you an extra die of damage instead of just make it a plus one striking weapon, which characters usually have by level four. Apparently that's not the only spell they revisited that they said were underperforming as you leveled up, but they did not name any more. Also, they made changes to spells that remove conditions. They have made a division between mind, toughness, and agility. There'll be a different spell for each of those. And also, if you fail in counteracting the condition or effect, you're still going to give a temporary benefit to the target. That sounds like a good change too. Last we get to items. I already talked about the new critical specialization effect that for crossbows that they've teased. Now we see a balance change to hammers and flails, which I have said are overpowered in their critical specialization effects. And I made a thread about this on Reddit that did not get a lot of support and a lot of people downvoted me in the comments. Uh, yeah, my suggestion got taken up by the Paizo design team. Um, I, I think it's a good change. This was the specialization effect that made someone prone uh, without a saving throw. Anyway, you can look on the screen what my criticisms of it were, but now they're gonna make it require a saving throw to avoid being knocked prone. Another big thing they announced, uh, that Jason Bullman announced, is that talismans are basically getting buffed. He didn't use that word, but that's clearly the intent. Talismans, as I said and showed in one of my videos, are often forgotten by players, and they could also use a boost. And in my next House Rules to Ignore video that I had been planning, I was going to say that talismans shouldn't require that you be minimum proficient in a skill in order to use. So instead of something that you were easy to forget, like the current Bronze Bull Pendant, which you have to be proficient in athletics to use, and it only gave you a, what, plus one bonus? And you have to declare it before you attempt actually a plus two bonus, you now have to actively use as one action in order to push somebody farther if you succeed at shoving them. So they want to make these more impactful, more unique, more flavorful, and less prone to being forgotten. I definitely support this design goal for talismans. Then they have also spoiled that they're going to be making crafting easier. I'm going to read it out. Michael Sayer says, we reduced the setup time and you can reduce it even more if you have the formula. Formulas have also had some updates to make them more exciting, affordable, and accessible. I had been planning in a video uh, to do more rules to ignore, a sequel to my first video, and one of them was to make formulas more available. Because right now, 
The main benefit, arguably, of the crafting skill is not in saving money and getting more value out of your book, but in getting access to more items. And right now, you're limited by the level of the settlements you're in in what formulas you can purchase. And you probably can buy the actual item in that same settlement. Hopefully, they're making formulas more accessible. The last tidbits is that they said they're going to be rebalancing poisons. I'm looking forward to hearing about that. There will no longer be staves defined by the spell school that they support. And the exciting news that there will be reinforcing runes for shields. Right now you're forced to choose between having a strong shield that you can shield block with versus having something with cool, magical, flavorful abilities. Now you can make those cool shields more suitable for shield blocking with these runes. So overall, what do I think? Uh, there's a post on the subreddit asking us how much we like the changes that we're hearing about, and I voted I really, really like it. I think that these things are generally strict upgrades to me, and I like the fact that Pathfinder overall is becoming even more its own standalone system, using this occasion of legally separating from the OGL to do their own take their own stab at a number of concepts in the game, which I think will be kind of cooler than what we've seen. Not being bound by alignments, I think that'll be cool to say to players who are considering the two systems. And back to the beginning of the video, this absolutely is a new edition, and I'm calling it 2.1. And improvement and change are good. So tell me what you think. Is there anything that I missed in my coverage of the Pathfinder Remaster announcements? Leave a comment. Also, tell me if you agree or disagree with anything I've said here. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm going to be continuing my Pathfinder Law School series. My next thing I plan to do is a live stream where I look at and react to a few notorious videos that have turned many people away from considering Pathfinder 2e. If you want to get a notification about when that is, like and subscribe and ring the bell. And that's it. I have been the Rules Lawyer, and I'll see you next time.